Welcome to the Audio Socket Podcast. We're currently exploring the impacts of AI on the music industry and how artists and creators will thrive in an AI era. Hi, welcome. Today I'm joined by Max Hilsdorf, who is a data scientist, a musicologist, and also a musician. As such, he spends a lot of his passion time working on a Medium blog that's been exploring AI technologies that are impacting the music industry. Welcome, Max. Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining. Um, So I was introduced to you first, um, I think by Jesse Josephson, who has Sync My Music on YouTube. But then I found an article that you wrote on Medium about breakthrough technologies in 2023 and some predictions for 2024. Do you mind telling our audience about what you found as the most exciting AI technologies that emerged in 2023? Oh, yeah, sure. So I think, you know, 23 was the AI breakthrough year. Uh, You could say, I mean, it got a lot of media attention and uh, attention in the the wide population. But I think actually, when you look at it from a technical perspective, it was, was mostly one special kind of AI that really got all of the attention. And it's everything related to this, you know, text technology, like understanding text, but also, you know, using maybe text inputs to generate something. So the text domain and also kind of the gen AI domain. And music has been no exception. I think the the one gigantic breakthrough we saw in 2023 was, you know, text to music uh, generation. Uh, I think Google uh, released their Music LM model in January 2023. So, you know, right to start the year off, kind of three months after um, ChatGPT was released. So it's like really at that exact time where everything was going crazy already. And this was really uh, a shock moment for me and for many other people, because it was really, you know, a big leap from the previous technologies that we had, where it was obviously, it didn't even sound like music. And then we started seeing these models that actually produce something that's remotely like human music, although clearly is still flawed in many ways. But as things go with technology, you know, when you see these early cases where you you see potential, it's probably going to take less time than you think until it uh, until it really breaks through and, and catches up to humans, potentially. Maybe that's something we'll also explore here. So text to music generation was the big thing. And I think there's been so many advancements here that it's, um, it's really the one technology overshadowing all the other um, smaller, but also very interesting uh, aspects. Uh, yeah. So were you looking at music AI technologies before 2023? Or like you said, was that really kind of the breakthrough moment where everybody started paying attention? Right. Yeah. I've actually been, you know, uh, invested in music AI for probably four years or something more now. So I'm really uh, during my studies already, I was really fascinated by what you could do with AI in the music domain. So it's been kind of a passion for more than four years now. But the kind of thing we called AI a couple of years ago, it's it's shifted a little bit. Um, a couple of years ago, what we considered AI was mostly related to music tagging, for example, or maybe recommendation algorithms or something like, you know, automatic mastering or uh, automatic mixing or these kinds of technologies. And nowadays we think of AI more as this smart generative assistant that produces things for us. Uh, And that's been put on the map really in late 2022. And that's also where I started uh, reading more about this generative music technology. Uh, But there's many cool things also happening outside of the generative AI domain. Well, so what are some of those cool things? Oh yeah, so for me, um, you could argue it is generative, but I, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm a big fan of source separation technology. Um, so uh, to non-musicians, it's always so confusing why that's not an easy task. So uh, they, they just think, you know, I'll just take the vocals and I'll just extract them from the track, you know, like with all of the karaoke versions that you see in the karaoke bars. But non-musicians don't actually know how hard this task is uh, and that people are actually building these karaoke versions from scratch because they can't do it with AI. And there's been a lot of progress in that domain. So the source separation technology we had, um, you know, two or three years ago, it's a huge quality difference to the kinds of tools that we have available today. And I see a lot of potential there. Uh, and overall, you know, these these AI technologies that are supporting you in finding music through natural language queries, for example, uh, through smart recommendations algorithms. I think that's that's a huge portion of the things that are happening. 
Yeah, interesting. So as far as looking forward, what do you want to see happen in 2024? Or what do you predict will happen in 2024? Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably harder to say what will happen in 2024, just because the, the speed of things is so unpredictable. Um, yeah. Just, you know, with ChatGPT being released, and then three or four months later, GPT-4, uh, and then all of these music techs, uh, I'm really, really very uncertain about the speed at which things will be developing. But the trends, I guess, are something I can talk about. And I think, you know, what I would like to see in 2024 is uh, definitely more progress on source separation because, you know, the quality is still not perfect. In most cases, you can still tell it's been AI separated. It doesn't sound absolutely natural. And there's still this, this last, you know, 5% that we need to get until these uh, stems that are AI separated are actually production ready, which would be such a huge, uh, a huge leap. Um, also, you know, music embeddings for, you know, non-data people, the embeddings term is probably really confusing, but what this really is about is kind of just, you know, representing music with numbers. Um, it's something that's been very transformative in the text domain. So for two or three years, we're now able to really reliably transform any text into a number representation and then do all sorts of calculations in the computer with that. Finding similar texts, you know, recommending or completing text that someone is inputting. And this embedding technology, which is kind of this process of mapping the music into the number domain, uh, is really something we, we need to put in more work because I believe there's incredible potential in improving all technologies we have, like music tagging, recommendations, search, so many things will be automatically improving once this embedding technology gets better. Um, but I think the you know the thing that musicians will actually really feel in this year is hopefully that there will be more um, business cases for generative AI and just you know tools that you can actually use, not just some fancy public demo that Google Research is hosting. Um, or some new paper that people are posting on LinkedIn, but actually like really technologies that you can start using in your notation software, in your audio workstation, uh, you know, in your post-production practices, in your um, in anything you're doing, really quality control uh, for your music. Um, there's going to be a lot of actual technology for musicians to use. And that's that's what gets me most excited for this year. Yeah. Are there any companies that, that you specifically know are working in that realm that you would recommend artists take a look at just as far as what are these developments? How can they help the artist and who are the companies? Yeah. So the, the, the companies, there's so many new music startups, actually, you know, uh, really hard to give recommendations already. But there's, you know, it's the go-to tools that are actually starting to integrate these technologies. So I've, I've looked into um, Sibelius, for example, uh, the, the notation software I've, I've used also in my, in my studies. And they're also starting to implement AI features right in the tools that musicians are already using. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, there's VST plugins for drum sound generation. Uh, there will be amazing VST plugins for mastering and all of these other things very soon. And sometimes they already are. Mm -hmm. And I believe, you know, Mostly for musicians, it's not so much about, you know, um, going on Google Scholar every day and looking for the newest papers, but really just seeing what AI technologies are being integrated into the tools that they are already using, possibly. So uh, in your audio workstation, for example, I know that Native Instruments is uh, actively working on some really cool projects where you... You don't, you know, you have a text to music system, but it's not producing a ready-made generated track, but it's actually producing from your text description a um, sampler input. So it's essentially you you write what you want. I want a French horn with alien sounds or something. And then you actually get a French horn with alien sounds, which naturally adapts to the, the range of the instrument and also to the velocity that you're pressing the keys with. So I think there's there's going to be some, some cool things in that domain. Amazing. So... As a musician yourself, um, what do you want to see? So, um, I mean, personally, the music kind of music I am, you know, producing and playing is mostly the old school kind of blues rock thing. So this is probably something that will be very, um, will be not so much disrupted by the AI technology. Uh, but I do think, you know, when I'm seeing these uh, these updates that are being added to notation software, for example, uh, I'm really keen to trying some of these things out because 
Um, I'm a coder, of course. I like programming. And when I open my um, my IDE, my programming environment, essentially, I immediately have my coding assistant, which is essentially an AI assistant that completes every line that I'm writing. I only have to write 50% of the code because while I'm typing, I'm already getting suggestions for how it could continue. I can ask questions mm -hmm. about, hey, can I rearrange the code that I'm writing? And when I, you know, when I look at notation software, to me, it seems like that would enhance the experience so much. Having in your notation software or in your audio workstation also, when you're, you know, editing the MIDI roll or something, uh, you're getting, you know, like real-time recommendations on what could be the next note or how you could maybe rearrange uh, a chord that you've written or how you could, you know, rearrange a melody across different stems or different instruments. Um, and I think there will be something like that in the future, and it will be amazing. So that will definitely get me back into uh, into composing. I love it. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it seems like writer's block will be a thing of the past with this. And, and just, you know, to your point, you can go in so many directions with every single note. So seeing really rapidly all the directions is, is pretty amazing. So um, you've just shared a lot of things that are on the, I'd say really positive side of music AI. What do you see as being the risk? What is the risk of the AI technologies that are emerging to artists that are working in the industry today? Yeah. So I, I think the the risk that I usually highlight is actually the the most obvious one regarding you know automation and job loss. Um, to make it very plain, um, I do think with you know any kind of technology that is built for automating workflows, uh, or at least, you know, um, augmenting the workflows in a way that they take much less time. There's always a risk that this, you know, this automation reaches a certain level where some jobs or maybe some parts of your job that you love doing will actually be automated by the AI. Um, and I do think that's something that musicians should be um, wary about, but also curious about in, in the sense of, you know, how is my job profile changing and which activities can I already support with AI and how should I maybe also either use the technology or, you know, kind of re readapt or uh, re re rethink how I'm doing my job. Um, I do think there are some professions that are actually at risk of being, uh, being significantly influenced by AI technology. For example, the stock music production market. That's the first thing I tend to think about. I'm not saying there will be no stock music producers. Um, obviously, you know, we've had AI image generation technology for, you know, something like almost two years now in a kind of usable quality. And there's still so many people producing stock images successfully and making a living off of it. But there's no denying that it's a disruptive technology. So when I'm writing my new um, next medium blog or something or creating some sort of content, you know, 50% of the time I might be using a stock image and 50% of the time I might be AI generating it. But that's already 50%, you know, of the time that I'm not using the stock images anymore. And I think that is a real risk, especially for the kind of music where there's little social connection to the creator, where there's little um, kind of human interaction between the listener and the actual creator mm -hmm. and also some of these crafts um these crafts like mastering and mixing i think of course there will always be professional human master and, and mixing people who are really good at this task but you know for the average person who cannot afford for example to uh, or maybe does not want to afford a professional mixing and mastering and they will use these ai technologies when they're ready for this so i think you know anything that's either really a very crafty kind of thing that AI can solve by understanding the rules that you apply in this craft, or if it's something where the social connection between the musician and the, the consumers doesn't actually matter. I think these are fields where, um, yeah, where musicians should be careful and also reconsider maybe how they, how they want to continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard a few times around, so I'm guessing this is actually a, a common theme. I've been hearing that something like 60% of the jobs that like the kids of today will have are unknown to us right now, yeah. which, you know, is how evolution works. I mean, anytime you have a disruptive technology, it's going to take um, and automate certain parts of an industry, um, but it'll also proliferate other parts of the industry. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, good to be going 
in eyes wide open, I guess, and and just with the information. I was really blown away last year at how far um, technologies came within a, a span of a year. When people were asking me, I'd say I first started getting questions at the end of 2022 about whether I felt like generative AI would would seriously impact audio socket. And initially, I quite honestly was probably too dismissive. Um, I still feel like, so Audio Socket really thrives. Um, we started out as a band catalog, uh, working with a lot of indie bands around the globe. We've got over 3,000 bands and artists. And I think they do feel like, um, you know, they're more in that component of uh, writing for fans, um, not really, you know, kind of writing with a specific purpose in mind, although some are. But um, that seems to be the consensus in terms of where generative AI has come is that, it probably is going to impact that uh, more stock music market, uh, maybe production music market first. So uh, do you feel like it threatens all musicians? Um, do you think that generative AI is actually going to get to that level where there's just not a need for any human artists? Right. Um, maybe just to, to add something to to the last uh, question, because, you know, while I, before I answer that one, uh, while I do think there is a risk for certain job profiles being significantly kind of subject to automation, and there will be fewer people who can make a living off of producing stock music in the future. Uh, I don't think it's going away anytime soon, like going away. Because if you look at ChatGPT, for example, this has been out for uh, more than a year now, one year and, you know, a couple of months or something. And we've had this technology for a while, and it's a very transformative technology. Everyone is using it. But when you go online and you're reading some newspaper article, 99% of them are still being written by humans. They're not being generated by AI. So it's not like once the technology drops, everything will be AI generated within a couple of months. So just kind of to, to uh, I think this will be transformative, but there will be, you know, a transition process that also music musicians can react to and reorient themselves. Um, but that's just kind of adding on to that. And I do think, you know, in the long run, um, I do not see the risk that AI will take over music creation as a whole uh, because music is an inherently social thing. Not only when, in the obvious case, when you go to a concert and, you know, maybe you've been seeing these uh, Taylor Swift tour videos all over social media or something where people just going to these concerts, going crazy, listening to the same song. Maybe it's even autotune uh, playback, depending on which show it is. And it's like, but people are having the time of their lives because of this social connection. And it's actually even the case that when we're listening to music and um, not in a live setting, but really listening to music on Spotify or something, we still can measure in a psychological research that there's a um, social interactiveness to this music listening. So a social component, even when there's no real human standing right next to you. And I think that will be only, um, only increasingly the case as AI generated content, you know, penetrates the entire internet. So, and when there's a hundred thousand new songs generated every day or a hundred million, it doesn't matter at this point, uh, we will be more interested in exploring human created music because it, you know, gives us some, some value on the social dimension. And, uh, I think it's very, very unlikely that most people will prefer listening to AI generated music, like in, in most real life settings, than they would uh, prefer listening to human made music. So you're saying, sorry, you're saying that you think people will be more interested in listening to human made music over AI. Yeah, I think in most cases, if I show you two pieces of music and they're, you know, have the exact same quality, you would like them both equally. But then I tell you, one of the tracks is AI generated. Uh, which one would you listen to, right? Um, most people would go with the human gener or created one if they have the opportunity to and if they do know. So I think there's something something important about music being a social th thing from humans to other humans. And I think this will be preserved in the future. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a big advocate for curation. Uh, that's definitely one of the pillars that we've built Audio Socket on is just curation is king because there is so much content. And today there is so much content. Yep. <laughs> so I think uh, I think that'll, you know, play into what you're talking about, which is um, part of the human realm is is the curation and the craft that they bring to it. Um, and I even can tell, like I've used chat GPT quite a lot for when I'm trying to write something, but I always have to add my own tone 
to mm-hmm. get what feels to me human. So I think we're always we're always bringing our human magic back into our craft and what we're doing. But yeah. um, I'm curious how you feel as a musician. I am not a musician. Tried when I was very young and just didn't have the skill. So therefore, I built a business around music because I absolutely loved it and couldn't imagine my life without it. But um, understanding the limitations of my own skill. How do you feel about people that are not musicians being able to create really incredible music using generative AI? Does that does that feel like, um, yeah, that's a fantastic, you know, empower anybody to create? Or does it feel a little bit um, precious? Like, mm-hmm. well, you know, this was trained on something that me and many other people that were skilled did. And now this person who has no talent can actually go and, and you know, create something. Yeah. So I think it's almost solely positive. Um, I do view this as a democratization effect that we've seen in many, many domains. And I actually don't think this is something new. You know, when you when you would talk to someone from the 1930s or something, the way they produced music, the way they had to learn their instruments, the resources they had available to learn the instruments, and then also, you know, just uh, playing the instrument, affording the instruments, recording their music, publishing their music. And then you talk to some guy today who's sitting in the living room with their MIDI keyboard with uh, 32 keys, producing like high-end uh, electronic music and selling it online successfully. That's like, they would be jealous and they would make the exact same arguments. You know, they would say the MIDI keyboard is is cheap. You know, it's democratizing mm-hmm. music, but in a negative way. It's like, it doesn't take any actual skill playing a guitar and a saxophone and drums on the same instrument. Uh, so I do believe, you know, if that's the case, so if democratization of music creation is problematic, then it has already been problematic for the last decades because it's been going so fast. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's going to be, we're going to have to rethink what a musician is, obviously, because, you know, someone today playing on their MIDI keyboard and composing music and producing music on that would not be considered a real musician by most people in the 1950s or something. They wouldn't consider that a real musician, probably. And in the same way, you know, someone crafting music with text prompts and adjusting it and maybe using the output as a starting point and, you know, dragging around some notes and and adding some of their personal touch to this without much musical formal education. And that will be considered also, you know, a musician in the future. Um, So I think it has to do with more rethinking what makes a musician. And, you know, it's a little bit like I think what you have sometimes in university, um, when when my professors or some of my professors who were really strict and had really difficult exams, um, usually that was because when they went through university, they suffered as well. So, you know, like 30 or 40 years later, they think, hey, if they're going to university now, I'm also going to make them suffer because I had to. And do we want to inflict that on the future generation of musicians? Uh, maybe not. It's a great thing that they're having an easier time. Yeah. So, as it relates to disruptive technologies, um, I've, I've interviewed people on this series that think we're, you know, this is the most disruptive. And I have other people that think it's sort of a continuation of, you know, like you talked about, the disruptive technologies that have evolved to date. Mm. Do, do you see AI sitting in its own category of disruption, like more <laughs> industrial revolution kind of disruption as opposed to just sort of the next emerging technology? Uh, both, actually. I think, you know, the, the traditional AI, um, which was used mostly for automating, you know, existing workflows, um, that I see more as a continuation. For example, you know, some workflow, you you record instruments and then you want to, you know, synchronize them so that they're rhythmically more aligned. Um, back in the day, you wouldn't be able to do it. Now for, you know, uh, 10 years or 15 years, there's some tools available that help you do this. In the beginning, they were pretty simple and, you know, like, rule-based systems, essentially, operating, you know, with a rule catalog on the music waveforms. Uh, And nowadays, AI is being used for that process. Um, The end user doesn't actually realize the technology has been switched to AI technology. They don't know. They just click the, you know, synchronize button and everything is going into the grid. Um, So for them, it's just a quality improvement or maybe a speed improvement, so an optimization. And that's one component. Um, And that will be one major driver of the AI uh, transformation, just making everything more efficient to a degree that we haven't experienced so far. But with the generative AI um, kind of tools like music generation, text generation, image generation, 
I think that does add a new component to it because we weren't actually able to, you know, generate realistic text content on a human quality level, or at least approximately a human level quality uh, ever in the history. Uh, so I think, you know, being able to generate things that could be mistaken for actual human work, uh, that, that will be exceptionally transformative. And that I would put in its own category. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Um, so I'm curious, one more sort of, uh, I guess, just question that that's uh, just thinking through its impact. Um, would you as a musician want to make your music available for generative AI and not not specifically in a competitive capacity, although obviously those those models are, are definitely out there and we're seeing a lot of uh, sort of, like you said, more, I, I would call it, I, I don't just call it stock. I also say it's more the the, mu the music that just sort of brings forward a story as, as the, you know, underscore. But in terms of, you know, iteration and like I've got kids and Gen A, for example, they want to iterate on everything. They want to mess with it themselves. Does that seem exciting to you or does that feel like a threat to your music if, if you know, people want to take it and iterate on it and create new works from it. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it's, this has two sides because on the one hand, I think musicians should not, you know, um, undervalue, uh, the, the kind of, um, the music that they have and the, the, the relevance of their music, because, um, you actually need high quality human made music to produce good generative AI. That's like the key building block of AI generative technology. So, you know, just giving it away for free seems like a little bit of a waste because it does actually have a value. On the other hand, you know, how many tracks have you produced in your life? Uh, and most musicians, you know, if you're a professional musician, you've produced hundreds maybe, yeah. But if you're a hobby musician, maybe you've produced, you know, 20 or 50 or even less tracks in your entire life. And these AI models, they're being trained on millions, tens of millions of tracks. So, you know, your contribution to the success of the AI model is actually rather small. So if you're only acting as an individual, it's probably, you know, more rational to give your music to the AI if you're being, um, you know, remunerated to some extent. Hey, give me, you know, uh, 500 bucks and I'll rent you my music for AI training. You know, that makes a lot of sense in that scenario. But I do believe it makes sense to uh, to have, you know, um, groups of interests of musicians. So people grouping together and actually finding a, a remuneration system that is actually fair for everyone. Because um, what you have to know about these AI technologies is that, you know, when they train on your music, you might get a one time uh, training um, payment, something like, hey, we've trained on your 50 tracks, here's 100 bucks or something. And that might feel great for you, right? Now I'm, I'm making money off of Gen AI and that's amazing. But once this model is actually trained and it's able to produce music at human level, you know, you're never going to receive any more payments from uh, the AI provider because they have the model, it's trained and they can produce music without needing access to any of your catalog. So that's something, you know, you have to, to kind of uh, consider. I think if you're just an individual, it doesn't really make sense to pull out and say, yeah, I, I don't find this fair. I don't want to do this because does it really make a difference? Maybe morally, but rationally, not really. Uh, but it does make sense to explore, you know, new ways of um, finding fair remuneration systems where everyone participates in. Yeah. And there are technologies out there. I actually had a, a call this morning with a, a company that's building a really incredible ecosystem to support AI and, and derivatives, not so much on the millions to one um, more where it enables um, sort of like cover songs. There is a model whereby any artist can cover a song and the original author can make money. So if you use that as sort of the um, example um, where it's more um, a creative, less of a produce me a song from nothing and more of a, here's a song and I want to, you know, stem it or take it in this direction or completely like, you know, put these three songs together, more of a few to one, it can actually track and pay original authors in those sorts of models. So I'm, I'm all about that. And, uh, and I've actually been pitched by a few startups with really cool concepts that do involve AI, but it's, 
it is continuing to keep the artist as part of the revenue stream going forward. So I think anything that that, you know, like with cover songs continues to compensate the original authors, um, as long as it's it's, again, not directly competitive. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, you know, to me, that's, again, kind of going back to Gen A and Gen Z, even where they just want to be part of the the creative process. So I think it'll I think we'll see a lot of emerging models that leverage existing music, but again, in maybe more of a few to one as opposed to a training model that's millions and millions to one. Yeah. And I mean, if you if you as a musician, if you are a recognized brand, you know, your voice uh, has a value, um, a branding value. Um, the your songs are very popular people would love to cover them in that case there's actually some really cool things you can do um yeah. there's also been you know what something that google announced for youtube is that some artists have been starting to rent out their voice uh, for um, AI generated uh, YouTube short videos. Essentially, you can type in a text and then you get T-Pain's vocals uh, with your text that you type in. And that's something, of course, where T-Pain is actually included and, and uh, remunerated for every single generation, or at least there's some contract. Uh, uh, but of course, you know, if you're unknown and no one actually wants to rent your voice um, <laughs> because you haven't reached that level of popularity, right. Yet, right. that doesn't actually become a relevant revenue stream for you. So um that's that's again the problem, you know. For those that are already established musicians, of course, there are more opportunities than for those who are really trying to make it. But that's always been the case, right? It's always been easier for those on the top in the music uh, industry. Yeah, yeah. Are you talking about Lyria? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's yep. kind of mind blowing, really. Um, yep. Awesome. Well, is there any advice that you would give to artists today in terms of, I guess, just thinking about AI, um, you know, I think this show is really meant for people that really don't know anything about AI, as well as people that are, you know, deeply immersed in, in understanding and using AI. But is there any sort of just advice you'd give to artists approaching AI music technologies? Yeah, I mean, that's probably the advice that, that they hear a lot. But I would say, you know, to stay curious uh, is the most important thing, because as you said, you know, a huge percentage of the jobs that people will have in the future and also, you know, people today who already have a job, the kind of tasks that you'll be doing in the future to make a living, they will be very different from today. And it's very likely that the speed of transformation is accelerating. So, you know, um, the kind of technological advancements in the last 10 years, they might only take five years now or three years. So um, it's very hard to make predictions about that because this is kind of why I think, you know, um, people pu should put themselves in the position if they can, you know, it's always more easily said than done, but put themselves in a position where they can and want to be flexible with the tasks that they're actually doing. So if you have your, if your, you know, your prof main profession is mastering music for others, then maybe there's, there's something, uh, some way that you can also adapt your own self image, your identity from someone who only does this exact, you know, craft to someone maybe who improves the quality of other people's music through any technological means that they have. And if you kind of have this self-identity and start, you know, looking for the technology that can support you with this role and not this one craft that you're currently doing, um, you might be in a better position for the future if it does become the case that your profession might be in danger. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Audio Socket Podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes and more guest speakers.